John chapter 19, beginning in verse 28 this morning. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I thirst, two words in the English, just one in the Greek, I thirst. There's a universal human experience, I have it right now, of being thirsty, physically. We all know what it's like to be thirsty, whether it's lying in bed at night with a fever and you're craving for water, or whether you've taken a long jog, a long Kelly drive, and you're thirsty, or you've participated in some athletic event, or you're on a mission trip in some third world uh, country that borders the equator, like Albania, like I have been, and you just crave water. Thirst is a universal human experience. And that's probably why Jesus, as well as the Old Testament, use it as a metaphor to describe the universal longing of the soul for satisfaction. We all crave something inside to satisfy us. We've all cried, I thirst physically. Hopefully, you can remember a time in your life when you experienced a thirst for God. I can. It was a long journey. It was a hard journey. I had to get beat up a little bit and emptied out. And like the prodigal son, I had to come to the end of myself. But one day I realized I had a thirst that could not be filled by anything that I was attempting to fill it with. There was nothing that I found that could satisfy this longing of my soul. Not to say there weren't things that I enjoyed for a moment. Like someone asked me, you know, are you rested from, you know, five days in the Dominican? And my response was, uh, that was good for the time I was there. But you can't bring it with you. Jesus is the only one who keeps satisfying. But the truth is, if you have found and are finding satisfaction in Jesus, it gives you the ability to enjoy other things in life without making too much of them or depending too much on them and for seeing them for what they are. It's a vacation, it's an enjoyable time, it's good, but it won't satisfy that longing of your soul. It has its place and purpose, but you can't keep it with you. I have pictures of it, but I can't feel the warmth of the sun or the coolness of the water uh, just from the pictures. Uh, only Jesus keeps on satisfying the soul. Physically, we've all cried, I thirst. Spiritually, many of us have cried, I thirst. These are words of physical longing, at least that, but more than that, but they're at least that. Philip Ryken, the former pastor of 10th Press, put it this way. He said, the thirst of Jesus Christ was a genuine thirst. Wounded men are often thirsty as their blood drains away, their fluid levels are depleted, and they crave liquids. That's especially the case when a man is crucified, for crucifixion is a long, slow dehydration. And if you remember in reading the passion narratives that early on in Jesus' time on the cross, they took a sponge and they dipped it in some sour wine mixed with myrrh, 
and put it up to Jesus' mouth, and Jesus refused it. He would take nothing. But now, later, as he's hung on the cross for hours, they dip that sponge in sour wine. Doesn't say it's mixed with myrrh, so likely something else. And they put it to his mouth. I like the way that Matthew Henry, the old commentator, and Alfred Edersheim, uh, who writes on the life and history of Jesus the Messiah, they say pretty much the same thing about that, about why he said no to the first and accepted the second. Edersheim puts it this way, for as he would not enter on his suffering, for as he would enter on his suffering with his senses and his physical consciousness, he would not take the narcotized wine. He didn't want to be numbed in the beginning to his suffering. He wanted to feel the suffering of the cross. But so now that he would not pass out, and lose his senses and his physical consciousness so he can face the final moment with full strength. And with full strength, he will cry out, it is finished. He takes that final taste. Two words, again, one in the Greek, that are given to us not simply because they tell us about his body's need for water. Because as John records these words, John says that these words are put in a time frame. They are said purposefully. They have a redemptive sense to, that, to them. Again, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, and John puts in to fulfill the scriptures, he says, I thirst. So there's a timing to these words. There's an understanding in Jesus' mind of the necessity to utter these words. And there's a purpose to these words. So in the moments we have, I want to unpack a little bit that one word in Greek, I thirst. To hear the Son of Man, the Son of God, say, I thirst. It's sort of an oxymoron. I called this message the thirsty God. That God could be thirsty. The one who created all of the waters and divided the lands from the waters. The one who put into play the system of how the clouds draw up water and let loose the water. And the water finds its way to the streams and rivers and back to, back to the oceans. And this cycle just goes on and on and on. To imagine, as Google tells me, that there are 326 million trillion gallons of water on this earth. That if there's 8 billion people on earth, that means there's about 40 billion gallons of water for everyone. And if it were all drinkable and accessible, nobody should ever say, I thirst. And all of this is Jesus's. He owns the mountains, the rivers, the cattle. It's all his. And yet the Son of God, the creator of the world, cries, I thirst. It is a human cry. It expresses humanity's need and deepest longing. He cries as one who is truly man. Perhaps not just physical thirst. Perhaps even what what, what the, the metaphor is in Scripture. You know, Isaiah 55 says, All of you that are thirsty, come! Come and drink. Don't bring any money. You don't have to buy it. There's a place, a fountain, where you can drink freely. 
And later in the chapter, he tells us what it means to drink. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will abundantly pardon. So drinking is coming to God in repentance and seeking his mercy and knowing his forgiveness. And once you've experienced it, your, your soul is satisfied. Did Jesus thirst in this moment for God just like he thirsted for water? Matthew tells us as he tells the passion story that the cry of Jesus took place prior to this. Though Matthew doesn't record these words, he records the giving of uh, the sponge to Jesus. But just prior to this, Jesus had cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus, who had lived in perfect, eternal fellowship with his Father, always enjoying this immense, unfathomable love, knowing what it was to have joy in the presence of the Trinity, eternal joy, that in a moment, he's not only thirsting physically, in a moment, he has a sense that as he bears the sin of the world, he is separated from his Father. And again, it's that unfathomable mystery how can this happen what does it mean and we say we don't know but Jesus is experiencing something that is painful that is hurtful as he bears the sin of the world and his father who cannot bear to look on sin who is so holy who abhors evil pours out judgment on his son I thirst. I thirst. He identifies with you and with me. He tastes for a moment what we have tasted, some of us for a lifetime perhaps, a life that is without the presence, the satisfying presence of God. Because it's only God that satisfies, and Jesus knew this for eternity, but as he bears our sin, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're all thirsty. Advertisers realize this. I'm sure you do as I, you look at a commercial and you say, what in the world did that have to do with what's being advertised? But it's appealing to something else that you one, it's appealing to your desires that everybody is looking for something that can make their life better. Sometimes it's just water. You need a drink of water, but if you go into Wawa or 7-Eleven, you've got shelf after shelf, door after door that is filled with so many options. And the truth is, Though many of them satisfy, none of them eternally. None of them satisfy forever. Everything we think will meet this thirst of our soul eventually leaves us empty. I've met many a happy drunkard who wakes up miserable. I know what it is in the pursuit of drugs, to enjoy the rush and the feeling. But to know that it passes and you have to find it again and seek it again. And with the sexually promiscuous who for moments of pleasure wake up with regret and shame. Or the frivolous spender who gets what he wants and yet, 
once more. It's like Rockefeller said, you know, how much money is enough? He said, more. It's never enough. There's this hole in our soul that cannot be filled with anything apart from a relationship with God. The one who speaks is truly man. He's truly God. He's the creator of the world, and yet he bears our sin, and he thirsts as a man, a man who's thirsty, a man who is bearing sin and separated from God in that moment. But it's not only a human cry. I thirst is the cry of the damned. Jesus tells the story of a rich man and a beggar. And in the story, he's not necessarily saying that rich men go to hell and poor people go to heaven. Rich people can get to heaven through Jesus and poor people can find their way in hell without Jesus. But in this particular story, the rich man goes to hell. And Jesus tells the story. He lifts the lid off of hell and allows us to look into it and hear the cry of a man, the desperate, unquenchable thirst of a man in hell. And the man cries out. He says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Matthew Henry comments on this. He says the torments of hell are represented by a violent thirst. In the complaint of the rich man who begged for a drop of water to cool his tongue, to that everlasting thirst, we had all been condemned if Christ had not suffered on the cross and said, I thirst, I thirst so that you may not have to eternally thirst, I thirst. Because of his cry, you don't need to make that cry and live with that cry forever. Many of you, some of you have heard me tell the story of how I told that story of the rich man and Lazarus and hell uh, to my little children one day at the dinner table. That was a long time ago because my youngest is now 30. But as they sat there, my young son, my uh, youngest son, probably about five years old, is listening intently to me read the story and talk about this man who was in hell 2,000 years ago who's crying out for water. And his question to me was, Daddy, is that rich man still crying? A profound question for a five-year-old. And the sad answer is, yes. It's a thirst, it's a longing that will never, ever be satisfied once you die without Jesus Christ. That's why he says, come to me, you'll never thirst. That's why he talks to the woman at the well who comes to get water to satisfy her thirst and the thirst of her family. And, and Jesus says to her, I will give you water, which if you drink it, you will never thirst again. And she says, where will you get this water? You don't even have anything to draw it up out of the well. No, the water that I give you in so many words is me. Believe in me. Trust in me. Come into union with me and enjoy my life because my life in you is 
like water satisfying the thirst of the soul. And as he said later, it, when, when you have this water, when the Spirit of God comes in you and fills your life with water, your life will be overflowing. You will have water, not just for yourself. You have water to give to others. I thirst shows the true humanity of Jesus Christ. It shows the suffering. It gives us a window into the suffering that he endures as he is bearing our sin and bearing the judgment of God. But John inserts, he said this to fulfill the scripture. So John's telling us that Jesus not only suffers as a man, suffers as one who is being judged by God in our behalf. But he suffers as a despised and a rejected king. Commentators debate over where we uh, find in the Old Testament the reference that, that John is referring to, that Jesus said, I thirst to fulfill the scripture. And many would say, and it's possibly correct, that it's the text that we read together today, Psalm 22, where it, is, it seems to be talking about terrible suffering and crucifixion. And, and we look back and say, yeah, that's talking about, about Jesus Christ. But when the, that psalm was first penned, David was the king of Israel. He was God's anointed for that day. He was God's representative on earth. And he was hated by the nations about him because he represented God. And so he had enemies and he was often attacked and driven to the wilderness. David was despised and rejected. He's a fitting type in many ways of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it could be some uh, 22. Or it could be Psalm 69. Psalm 69 begins like this, to the choir master, according to Lilies, a Psalm of David. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there's no foothold. I've come into deep waters. The floods sweep over me. I am weary with my crying, my throat is parched, my eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. And then later in that psalm, they gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Well, again, that's David's experience. He is God's anointed, God's representative. He is hated. He is despised and rejected of men. And Jesus, in uttering those words, and John saying, he said this to fulfill that scripture, John is telling us that Jesus is not just a son of David, not just a Davidic king, but he is the son of David, the Davidic king anticipated, foreshadowed by all other kings of the Old Testament. He is the anointed one. He is the king of Israel, but not just the king of Israel. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and he's despised and rejected of men. And as he hangs there, hated by the world, hated by his own people, as he hangs there, he cries out, identifying with the history of those who have been despised and rejected as they represented God. He hangs there as a king, despised and rejected of men. But not just any king, not just like David in some ways, but more than David. 
For as Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost and begins to declare that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, the Son of David, he goes back again to the Old Testament. He talks about Psalm 2 and Psalm 16 that, talk about, that, that are words of David, where David says, you know, God, even though I die, you will not leave my soul in hell. You will not banish my soul to the grave. David had a belief in resurrection. But Peter says David was not really talking about himself, essentially, because David's body is still in the grave. He was ultimately talking about Jesus Christ, who three days after he was crucified, rose again. He lives. And he says that God has raised this Jesus whom you crucified, and he has set him on the throne of David, not in Jerusalem, but at the right hand of God where he rules not just Judea, but he rules the entire world because he is king of all kings. This is the one who is crying, I thirst. Why? Why this king of kings put himself in such a place? Why the creator of the entire world? Why would he put himself in a place of need where he must cry out, I thirst? Why? Of course, we know the only satisfying answer is he chose to do that so that I wouldn't have to cry out forever. His cry in that moment delivers me from an eternal cry of suffering. He suffers as one despised and rejected. He thirsts so that I may never thirst again. Some of you have felt the sting of hatred. You've borne the brunt of racism. Peter and I were just talking uh, before the service this morning, and he was saying, you know, even though I'm African, if you and I went to visit South Africa, you would get treated better than I would because you're a white American. That's just the way it is. This is the world we live in. So you know what it is. You've tasted a bit of racism or rejection, or perhaps you've felt the shame of poverty or the isolation of being put on the outside and you only look in and desire what, what others have. Well, this is Jesus in this moment. Rejected, despised. So badly despised, they spit on him. I don't know if there's anything. I'd rather be punched than spit on. But Jesus bore all of that. Worse, racism, poverty, shame, deprivation, isolation, than you will ever taste in your life. Worse hatred. But he bore that. He bore that so that he could redeem us and bring us into a world he calls the church. The church which is the present manifestation of the kingdom of God. An imperfect representation, but still a real one. Hopefully a taste of what the future will be. Where in the church there should be justice because we are under a king who is just. Where racism is put aside, where it doesn't matter whether you're black or white or Asian or whatever it is. Where your economic status doesn't matter now, I know going through your minds, you're saying, but where is that church? Well, it's where we make it, by his grace. 
That's what the gospel intends to do. That's why Jesus cries out, I thirst. So that things as they are would no longer be. They would be remade and restored under his kingship. And so, so that the church living in the world becomes a microcosm, a miniature picture of the world that is to come where people truly do care about each other. They love each other. They meet each other's needs. And I know in all of our minds we're saying, yeah, I, I, I wish we had more of that. But it all starts with God's work in me. That's what we want. And when we want it together, then one of the purposes of Jesus' suffering becomes fulfilled. He, become, he thirsts so that we can become part of a family where the human barriers created by sin are destroyed, where we can belong to a kingdom where there's justice and equity and righteousness. And if it's not there, then let's repent and seek his grace to put it there. I thirst is a cry of one despised and rejected so that we might not have to live with being despised and rejected. But also I thirst is a cry of victory. Notice what John says. He says, Jesus knowing that all was now finished. Later, Jesus will cry, it is finished. It's actually the same words. Perhaps you've heard preachers use the Greek word tetelestai. It is finished. Well, it's actually used twice in this text. Jesus, as he thinks through the entire plan of God from eternity past, when God determined to create a world and redeem a people for his own that would live with him forever. And as this plan is unfolded through the thousand years of history and comes to culmination in the cross of Jesus Christ, knowing now that as he dies, the very center point of history, the high point of history has now been reached. As he dies, the plan of God is being fulfilled. It's finished. All that is necessary to create this new people of God, this new humanity, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, it is finished. He cries out, I thirst, I suffer. I am really suffering so that this may be achieved. And then he takes that offer of sour wine that's put to his lips. And in a moment of rejuvenation, a moment of strength, he cries out, It is finished! And he bows his head. And the wonderful plan of redeeming sinners is done. All it awaits is God's stamp of approval when he reaches down into that grave on the third day and brings Jesus out and says, in so doing, I accept what Christ has done. That's why Paul says, if you're going to be saved, then you have to Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You must believe that God accepts and approves the work of Christ on Calvary and he declared that by raising him from the dead. Finally, let me say that the words I thirst is actually a cry of invitation. <laughs> Jesus said, whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. 
He'll not be thirsty forever, literally. The water that, that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When we come to the end of the Bible, when God assures us through the book of Revelation that though the world may look bad at times, the final triumph of God over all evil powers will take place. And after he assures us of that in that majestic book, he ends Revelation with this. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Are you thirsty? I mean, deep down inside, are you trying this and that? And, but you live with this gnawing dissatisfaction. You cannot find what satisfies your soul. Jesus says, I paid it all. I did it all. Now come and drink freely. As the songwriter says, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Let's pray together, shall we? <laughs> Father, thank you for the water of life that we find in Jesus. We find simply in believing in him. And as long as we keep coming and keep believing, as long as we look to find our life and our satisfaction in Jesus, we live with satisfaction in our soul. But as we sang earlier, we're so prone to wonder, prone to leave the God I love. We're so easily dissuaded and distracted by the appeals, the alluring appeals, the promises that say you can find what you're looking for here. Father, bring us to repentance for the false substitutes that we pursue. Bring us back to finding satisfaction in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.